tonight, um, we're going to be over in Luke chapter 12, and we're going to be talking about the wise servant. Now, we're, we're going to have to walk a path to get to that parable because we need to look at it in its fullest context. But even before I start there, I want to share with you uh, something that I was reading actually over the time that I was on vacation. And it's a book by Tom Rainer. Some of you guys probably know Tom Rainer. If you get within a half a mile of Lifeway, you're going to hear his name hollered out. And it's a uh, book called The Simple Church. It's been out for quite a while. But anyways, while I was on vacation, I decided I wanted to uh, finish this book. I had started it many times, and I said, you know what, I want to complete this book. And so I took it with me, and, and I read it on the way out, and, uh, on the way back from California. And this is the best part, is in the postscript here, it says, typically normal people don't read church research books on vacation. We do, but we're not normal. So if you're reading this on vacation, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> the long and the short of the whole book is this that church is not nearly as complicated as we make it and the problem is is that we actually fail the church in overcomplicating the process and so I've been reading that and kind of walking through all of that over these last couple of weeks and when I come back the parable that I'm supposed to go into is the parable of the wise servant and in the parable of the wise servant, Jesus says, it's real simple. <laughs> There's two things. You need to be aware of who I am, and you need to be fully committed to who I am. And if you aren't one or the other, then you aren't mine. It's that simple. As a church, as a believer, as families of God, that's what it boils down to. So, to understand it and to grasp what that parable holds, and by the way, it's going to come after me more it's going to come after any of y'all tonight. We need to start with the context of it, which in chapter 12, you find there in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, this. Now let's stop there and just absorb that for a minute. Who is he speaking to? Say it. The disciples. But he's speaking in front of a crowd. So what the disciples are going to hear, the crowd is also going to hear because they're all pressed in together. All right? And it's many thousands that are there. Isn't that an interesting phrase? I think King James is multitude. Okay, so you have this massive number of people that have gathered in for this one thing, and that is to be near Jesus, hear Jesus, learn from Jesus, see Jesus, all the rest. Now, stop and think about it. We were just talking about in a prayer time, Wilmore, Kentucky, a town of just a few thousand is being overwhelmed by thousands for one, what reason? <laughs> <laughs> Dale's phone's talking to him and he can't make it stop. I'm going to start bringing my hardcover over. <laughs> so when we talk about Wilmore, Kentucky and the thousands that are going there, why are they going? Well, actually, there's probably a lot of different motivations. The same motivations that probably are here right in this crowd. Think about it. Why would all these thousands want to come and see Jesus? What do you think? What's the, what's the purpose or the motivation that drew them to this place? Mostly curiosity. Yeah. Curiosity. Some thinking that they might get something to eat. Okay. I'd be not correct. He's such, <laughs> an awesome, he's such an awesome God, you want to get close to him. Okay, some actually out of love for God. Okay, the disciples are there, and they, they're committed to following Christ. There's no question about them. They're part of that crowd. But you also have folks who are there for curiosity. I, I noticed on the internet that uh, I think it was Tucker Carlson had a little thing on his show at one point, and he said that they actually reached out to the folks at Asbury and said, hey, we'd like to come down and, and take or, or do some, some uh, reporting on this. And Asbury said, please don't. And they basically said that to all the news agencies. They said, this is about God. It's not about the media. It's not about politics. This is just about God. And so they turned down the opportunity for that. They said Hansley Earnhardt go up there. She was there three hours this morning with boxing friends. Outside. Oh, she was outside. But outside. Outside the office. Well, it's, but it's she, a public she, sidewalk. She was interviewing the kids. Tomorrow. Right. But, you, but they don't allow them in. They don't allow them to start getting into that stuff because that's 
again, you can't stop people in the public square, but the people that were running the chapel, they were saying, hey, we're putting parameters on this. They told preachers, you don't get to preach. And when the preachers were coming, they were basically told, hey, we want you to sit back and participate and observe, but not lead. That's smart. Really, preachers can stir a lot of stuff up. Haven't you ever felt his arms around you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So you've got all these reasons, right? Some are coming out of curiosity. Some are coming because they're skeptics. Jesus is going to talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You cannot tell me that they weren't in the crowd. He always addresses them face up. He just tells it to them straight. So you have all these different motivations as to why people would arrive. And this is the same thing for church today, right? People arrive at church for a million different reasons. You can't control why it is they've come. But what you can control is what we say to them when they arrive. And that's what Jesus does. And here's the thing, folks. When you really start to tell them the truth that Jesus wants to say, the crowd gets smaller. So what is Jesus going to tell the crowd? He's going to tell them two things. You need to be more aware of who God is. And you need to be more committed to who God has called you to be. That's it. Take a look. He says there in chapter 12, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you the truth, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more but I will show you whom you should fear. Now, I'm going to stop here for a minute and absorb that. What it says is that Jesus is telling the crowd, you think you know God. You have no idea how well he knows you. You think you understand God, but you have no idea how deeply he understands you. We have a belief that we have a personal life, but we don't. With God, it is a public life. Now, a good illustration of this is I've, I've tried to tell my kids and, and youth for years, everything that you send through technology is public knowledge. You say, well, no, no, I put you know privacy things upon it or it's you know sent to this encrypted place or it's got my privacy notice on it. Don't care. If you've texted, called, <coughs> emailed, posted, Whatever it is, even though you think nobody can see it, people can see it. Because if the right person wants it known, it'll be known. And kids today are blissfully unaware of exactly how much of their life is poured out in front of the entire world. Do they really care? Well, they don't care until they care. And that's the problem is that we are happy being ignorant until we wish we weren't. And that's what Jesus is saying. The crowd has come, and they've got a million reasons as to why they're there. Maybe some are there for food, like Dale said. And they are unaware of the Jesus they're seeking. They don't understand who he is. As a matter of fact, we'll prove that in just a minute. The second thing he tells them is you've got to be committed. You need to have a better commitment to God. And that's, that's the, the beginning of his sermon. He says, verse 4, I tell you the truth, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can do no more, but I will show you whom to fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has the authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Jesus, this is not how to win friends and influence people. What Jesus is telling them is, listen, you think you have a commitment to God you are more committed to the people that you're looking at physically than the God who is watching you spiritually. And you are more committed to this physical present life than you are to the eternal life that is coming. We are unaware of who God really is and we are uncommitted to what God is really asking. Because if we are, then this life becomes completely disconnected from us. And he becomes the only thing that we all revolve around. Now, Miss Jane, I wouldn't normally do this, but I do want to ask you this. And you feel free to tell me to go jump in a lake. 
when you were diagnosed with cancer, I know you already love Jesus. You've always had a passion for Jesus. You've served Jesus for many, 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 many years. But once you received notification of cancer and the concept of cancer became powerfully personal, did you find it changed anything in your spiritual process? Oh, no, I got closer. Well, the, then that's a change. That's my point. Well, I mean, it just, you know. Absolutely. The world wasn't important anymore. Exactly. Even though before you loved God, and even though before you served God, I've always believed that you have a great passion and a heart for God. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. But when we're told, hey, you know, tomorrow you may get to meet God. Well, it's different. It changes things. And, and that's what Jesus is saying. He says, you don't understand who I am, and you have no idea what it means to be really committed to me. <clears throat> Because we live in a world where we are blissfully ignorant and uncommitted to things that are eternally important. Well, I just turned my life over to him. Amen. It's, it's in your hands. Amen. And it's win-win either way. That's awesome. So, here is Jesus, and he is talking to the disciples, but the whole crowd is hearing him, and he is pounding home these two things. You don't know who I am, and you don't know what it means to be committed to me. And he finishes, verse 11, when you are brought out of the, before the synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about what you will, uh, how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. Remember, he's talking to his disciples. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Now, he finishes with this statement of, so when you're arrested, when you are put on trial, when you are drugged before the authorities, when you are put in prison, when you are persecuted, don't worry over it. The Holy Spirit is going to guide you in what to do. All right? Now, that is focused on the concept of commitment, right? We always talk in sermon uh, process that you're supposed to give the information and then give the application, right? He gave the information, which is... Don't fear this world. Fear the one that owns the next. And then the application is what? Don't worry about it when you get persecuted. Have courage and know that God's going to take care of this. All right? That is powerful stuff. And anybody that's truly listening realizes they've come to a place where there's a crossroads. Do I want to do religion like I always have? Or do I want to follow this guy who is out there? Now, here's the problem. A lot of folks are still very much unaware. In fact, because they're unaware, they're not listening. Take a look at the very next verse. He just talked about being persecuted, thrown in prison, and put on trial. And it says in verse 13, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, is that not the ultimate misunderstanding of everything Jesus just said? He clearly was not listening, right? Absolutely. He was, he was completely somewhere else. And, and I want to look at this guy and say, you know, how ignorant can you possibly be? But here's the problem, is that you and I come to church, and Jesus has a message he wants to tell us, but because my focus is somewhere else, I do not hear what Jesus has to say. There are many, many people who come to church and leave church and they never hear Jesus speak because they weren't looking for Jesus. He was looking for an inheritance. He was looking for the inheritance when he arrived. He'll be looking for the inheritance when he leaves. And he will never see Jesus unaware. And he will never be saved in that state because he will not commit. How do I know this? Because Jesus pounds the point home. If you will, I want you to take a look there in verse 32. He says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes and near and moth destroys. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your attention is, your awareness, your commitment will follow. So the guy comes and he says, Tell him he has to have split the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, not talking about that. In case you hadn't noticed, <laughs> we're talking about who I am and what's, com what's commanded of you. 
And he finishes with, so here's what we do. You go sell the stuff you have. You're not getting the inheritance. In fact, you're going to give up what you got so that you can come follow me. Do you think that this fella suddenly said, oh, I understand that. That makes perfect sense. <clears throat> no, he didn't grasp it. He probably walked away the very same way he came because he wasn't looking for Jesus, unaware. And he had no intention of making a commitment to Jesus. He wanted Jesus to commit to him. Now, can that happen in the church? Absolutely. So I'm going to share with you guys an illustration, and we'll probably share it on a Sunday in a sermon one time. And when I do, I want you all to act surprised like you've never heard me talk about it before. Okay? So when I, when I was in California, okay, I, I actually took a picture of this because I was in a little uh, shop that was there in uh, uh, California, and they had these little pocket crosses, Right? You could buy this little cross and put it in your pocket. When your hand went in your pocket, you'd feel that little cross. It reminds you that Jesus loves you and, and, and all's good in life and, and so on and so forth. And, and pocket crosses are not bad, right? No. No, I don't think it's necessarily bad. It's not necessarily bad. But here's the point of the picture. Because in California, there's all kinds of beliefs. And so, right beside the pocket crosses was a little thing called the burden bear. And you, you have the little burden bear in your pocket and it has a little poem and it says, you know, if you rub on this little bear, then he takes all your burdens away and he helps you carry all your depressions. Okay? And then if the burden bear is not working, you got a St. Christopher medal that's right beside it. St. Christopher medal is for all your traveling mercies. So if you are you know have a burden about a travel you're going to take, you, know, you get your Christopher medal and then you get that around your neck. That's going to cover you on that. And if, in case you're wondering and you're concerned that that's not going to be enough for when you leave home, there's a garden fairy pin that you can pick up and you put that <laughs> around your home. And the garden fairy protects with magic the place that you love, right? And then, and then the, you got this little hedgehog that you can buy and put him in your pocket. And you got on and on and on and on and on and on and on it goes. Everything you can imagine, every one of them had a box, every one of them had a poem, every one of them had a promise. And every one of them said that if you have this, it will give you this. I can't walk. I just <laughs> You're just weighted down with all this stuff in your pockets. Well, here's my point is that we as believers end up where we're supposed to be focused on God. When we don't feel like God's getting us what we want, then we grab the next thing and put it in the pocket. God's not doing what I asked him to do. God's not acting in the time that I asked him to do. God's not healing me the way that I wanted him to. Whatever it is. So I grab whatever the next thing is and say, well, maybe this one can help. Or that one can help. And we commit ourselves to all these little things that are not him. And by the way, it doesn't have to be some little medallion that you put into your pocket. It can be a lot of different things. How many folks are, are trusting in their tithe to get them to heaven? How many folks are trusting in their church attendance to get them to heaven? They expect they're going to show some sort of, you know, perfect attendance card for Sunday school. And God's going to say, well, I hadn't seen that coming. What things are we putting in our pocket instead of Jesus? Well, I don't have this cross on for that. My sister gave me this. <laughs> that is fine. I am not opposed to pocket crosses. <laughs> I carry marbles in my pocket. Yeah. But here's my point. I carry the marble to remind me of what I should do, not what I want it to do. Does that make sense? So you carry the cross from your sister to remind you of what she was to you or is to you. No, she was. Was, okay. So you carry her memory with that. But you don't expect that to create memories for you. No way. There you go. There's the difference. Go ahead, Larry. Brother, there's a long that line right there. Uh, something happened to me one day. I still remember this. It had been years ago. Something was on my mind. I was dealing with something that wasn't real good. And uh, I pulled up a blockbuster. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> and, and I started to get out of the car. And as I looked down, here's this little aluminum cross chief little old thing and I pick it up and you know what it says God loves you mm. 
I've still got that old cross. It's still sitting in my car. That's awesome. It is, it is. So. But it's not the cross no. that does it, is it? Yeah. It's it it's the cross right. Right. that he reminded you of. And let me know. That's it. So, yeah. so here's my point. Is that God, in our relationship with him, and God with the relationship with the church, has two simple things. You need to understand who I am. Be focused on me. Don't be focused on all this other stuff. Be focused on me. And then commit yourself wholly, completely, totally, fully, without any hesitation to him. That's all that he asks. Go ahead. That's something that always troubled me, and it's in this scripture and some others as well, about when Jesus says to sell all you have and give to the poor. We're not going to do that. Well, no, that's not true. Yeah, that is true. If you're mm-hmm. going to follow Jesus, you would. It depends. I mean, fo- totally following like the disciples. Right. The The question becomes, is that command, and if you look, you'll find that command, is in regard usually to a specific person. Well, true enough. Okay. All right. Well, no, 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 no. Don't, over, don't just don't gloss over that. <laughs> That's an important fact. Jesus doesn't say that to all. But those he says it to, it is required. So if if God calls one to preach and he fails to go preach, the scripture says to him who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. But if you weren't called to preach, then not preaching is not a sin. And so it's really important that we recognize these things because the scripture actually says that the workman is worth his wage, right? right. And the scripture says in the Old Testament that God established patterns of giving to actually supply the needs of individuals. So when should you give all that you have to God? Every day. You should give it all to him and then let him do what he wants with it. And so if God tells me, hey, you know what? So-and-so needs your car. And you need to turn it loose. And God puts that on your heart and he puts it on your mind and he says, this is me talking to you. Then you need to be going and doing that. But if if he hadn't put it on your heart and put it on your mind, then don't go out and just find somebody who's on a bike and say, you need a car. Here, have one. You know, (laughs) that's not how this works. So we appreciate you expanding on that for me because it helped. No, no, it's important. It's important. We, okay. Christians do a lot of things out of guilt. Yeah, really. Guilt is not commitment. Guilt is force. And it's a vastly different concept. That's a really good question. I'm glad. This is not a direction I expected to go, but this is important stuff. Because we operate in the church so often from that premise. You know? Why why do I need my perfect attendance card for church? Why do people feel the need to come to a pastor and say, I know I missed a couple of Sundays, but you need to understand. Right? (laughs) Did, did I come to your house and say, you know, does a pastor ever feel that need to come did to I the church? A couple of Sundays and... Yeah, did I miss a couple of Sundays? No, I do not. I don't either. Because if, if what I'm doing is out of guilt, then it's not true. That's right. So I didn't go to a church while I was in California, but I listened to our church. While I was in California, and you want to know why? I told you on Sunday why. I miss the family. Yeah. Makes you feel so much better. Yeah. Well, I was I was with my family, but I missed this family, mm-hmm. and I wanted to hear how y'all were doing. I wanted to hear how Hunter was doing. He's doing pretty good. Yeah. He's a redneck now. He's a redneck preacher. <laughs> so, what we need to do is understand when we talk about awareness and commitment. It is this awareness of who God is and what he's done for my life, which then makes me commit out of love for him fully, completely, wholly, totally, and without reservation. And that is what he aims for. And he aims for it within our own church. Now, listen, I'm going to have to move forward, but I don't don't want to miss a few things. He, He says there in verse 35, this parable of the servants, plural, okay? He said, be dressed and ready for service. Keep your lamps burning. Like servants, and don't don't miss that because it's important. Servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Now it says that when he does this, he then will actually serve the servants. Okay, that's what the parable goes on to say. 
It'll be great for the servants who are prepared for their master because when he returns, he will actually serve them. And, and Jesus actually does all these things. Everything he said about having to stand before, you know, those who are going to condemn you, he does that. Everything he says about serving the servants, he washes the feet of the disciples in the Last Supper. Everything that he says in this, he's actually going to perform, okay? But in this passage, in this parable, and I think you guys looked at it last week, he says servants, plural, meaning all who follow God should wait on God, be expectant for God, be longing for God, because we want to be ready when he returns to embrace him, okay? To live every day in that way. Now, is that easy to do? No, it's easy to get swept up in what's happening today and start to lose focus, awareness. And when I lose awareness, I lose commitment, okay? Now, I'm moving fast, so don't miss any of this, but, but go back and read some of this for yourself later. I want you to jump down there to verse 41 because this is where it shifts gears. Peter asked, Lord... Are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Remember, the crowd is pressed in. He's speaking to the disciples, but he knows, Peter knows, everybody's listening. And so Peter's hearing this, hey, as servants, you must be aware and committed. You have to be fully aware, fully committed. And he says, so are you speaking this to us or to them? Now, what's Peter trying to do here? Well, we're already disciples. We're already aware. We're already committed. So clearly what you're talking about is for these folks who need to hear it. Peter shouldn't have done that. Because now the parable goes from the plural to the singular. Pay attention to that. The Lord answered. Who did he answer? Peter. Who then is the faithful and wise manager? Whom the master puts in charge of his servants, plural, to give them their food allowance at the proper time. It will be good for that servant, singular, whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant, singular, says to himself, "Master, my master is taking a long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and to drink and to get drunk. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour that he's not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place, listen to this, with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready and does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much will be asked. Now, Peter heard him talking to the crowd and said, but I'm not a part of that. I'm already good. We're all set. Why? Well, because I'm generally aware of God and I'm generally committed to God. <laughs> so it's all good for me. And really, you're talking to them. They need to feel that conviction. And how many church people have sat in the pew and said, well, I sure hope she's listening to the preacher today. She really needs that message, you know? I hope that old Joe is, is catching on to what he's saying because he surely needs to understand what the preacher's trying to deliver. And they look around and they think, this message is not for me. Peter should have never done that. Because right. God turns around and he looks at Peter. And this is where, and I want you to understand this, this is not just for y'all. In a very real sense, this is just for me. Now, if you're a teacher of a Sunday school class, if you like to be a preacher or a leader in ministry, if you're a deacon and you say, well, I serve the church and I'm a leader of the church, well, then, dear friend, you just stepped into this parable. Because, he says, the servant who is supposed to be watching over the servants making sure that they are tended to and cared for. And what are they supposed to be doing? They are supposed to be making sure that they are aware of who Jesus is and they are committed to Jesus in their life. That's their goal. And he says when that servant loses focus of who God is and he loses commitment to what God has asked, listen very carefully, he says, it will be hell for that individual. If you're not sure, look at what he says. He says, 
The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready and does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. In verse 46, it says the master will come when the servant is not prepared and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Now, I'm not going to verge too far into once saved, always saved on this. But I could. It's just I don't have time. However, I will say this. He is speaking to leaders who have lost their awareness of Christ. And I would argue maybe never fully had awareness of Christ. And they have not made a commitment to Christ. They have committed to other things. Go back all the way to the beginning of the chapter. And what did he say? Don't follow the way of the hypocrites, which were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Of all the people that God ever spoke with, that he ever said were spiritually dead, it was the spiritual leaders that were in front of him. He said, they are unaware of who I am and they are uncommitted to the God who loves me. He says, you are sepulchers, whitewashed graves. Alive on the outside, dead on the inside. And his statement about the Pharisees and Sadducees is that you take a servant or a, an individual and he says, and you make them twice a son of hell that you are. In other words, you're training them to go to hell. Now, Peter asked the question. So Peter's getting the reply and Peter's catching it. And what Peter is being told is, listen, you think you're exempt because you're my disciple? You think you're exempt because you're not a part of the crowd? Listen, you're exempt. You're exempt in the fact that you have a greater responsibility. You have a greater requirement. You have a greater calling. And you tread on that at your peril. And I'm going to tell you right now, Peter never forgot it. I want you, if you will, before we close out tonight, to jump over into 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3. And he says there, beginning in verse, uh, let's see, uh, verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires, unaware of God, only aware of their needs. They will say... Where is the coming he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everyone, everyone thing goes on just as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget. They are willfully ignorant that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. It will come like a thief and the heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid Bear, there is not a word that you have uttered will, that will not be heard from the rooftops, right? There is not a thing you've done in secret that will not be put into the public square. There is nothing that you have done that will not be, dis there's nothing that you have done that will not be disclosed. Peter heard those words. Peter heard the words of Christ. You think you're exempt because you're my disciple? You are not exempt. You are all the more required to know who I am and to commit to what I've called you to be. And Peter didn't ever want to lose the fact that his master was coming. He never wanted to think for a moment his master wasn't coming. Now, I want you to provide some homework this week. And it's simply this. I want you to go through your entire spiritual regimen, whatever it is, okay? Church, Bible study, devotions, 
prayer, family devotions, ministries, service, worship, all the rest of it. And I want you to go through every aspect of it. And here's what I want you to ask. I want to ask two questions. One, am I doing this out of an awareness of who God is? Only out of an awareness of who God is. I'm not pushed into this by social pressure. I'm not hoping to gain something from this, from the, the social culture I live in. I want you to take away all the motives that you've got. And I want you to see, am I doing this because I know who God is? And then ask the question, am I committed to that in the way God asks? And then when you're done, take a look at the stuff that may need to be put aside. And then take a look at the stuff that you may need to push in. Lean in, they say, you know, lean in on it. Make a deeper commitment because you're doing it for all the right reasons. Does that make sense? If you do that, you may reduce some things that are normal church. You may actually start some things that are not normal church. Doesn't matter to me because the truth is, it's simple. It's all about Him and all about what He expects of me. And if you're doing those things, I promise you, you'll be ready when the Master shows up. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, I thank you so much for your love and for your grace. And Father, I thank you that you have forgiveness in you, that you offer to us and that you grant to us when we fail you. Father, we, we walk around sometimes in total ignorance of what you've asked of us. And other times, Father, in willful ignorance of what you've asked of us. And Father, many times we know what it is you have said, but we are just afraid to commit to what you've asked of us. Help us this week as we walk through all these elements of our spiritual life that we would see the things that need to change and the things that need to be poured into while we still have time here on this earth. Lord, I don't know when you're coming, but I do pray that when you do arrive, we all will be ready to meet you. We will all be ready to greet you. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Have a good night.